Okay. So our Torah portion for today, for this week, is uh, Toldat, and it means generations. Uh, we're going to start in where we left off last week in Bereshit or Genesis, and we, uh, oops, that's Exodus. We're going to start in chapter 25, and this, uh, this Torah portion uh, begins in verse 19. And it starts again with, this is the genealogy of Yitzhak. So these are the generations or of Yitzhak, Abraham's son. And uh, so, <clears throat> as we always do, we're going to go ahead and uh, summarize the portion and talk a little bit about a particular topic. So the half Torah portion, as I mentioned, is uh, Malachi chapter 1. Uh, through 2 verse 7. So we read this last night in the Arev Shabbat uh, meeting and you know this is the spot where uh, it talks about Jacob and and, uh, and Esau um, and this is a lot of what this uh, this uh, Torah portion is is all about. So we start in uh, chapter 25 and verse 19 and uh, we see here that uh, that uh, Ribka. Last week we we uh, discussed uh, a wife for for Yitzhak and Ribka, kind of typifying the bride of Messiah, Elazar, Abraham's servant, going there. His name means helper, comforter, kind of typifying the Holy Spirit and bringing bringing. Uh, the uh, the bride of Yitzhak or the bride of Messiah, who is typified by Yitzhak, uh, out of the world into and brings her to uh, the bridegroom. And uh, so here we see Ribka now. This is uh, 20 years later. Uh, so she's barren quite a long time. Yitzhak is 40 years old. When, uh, when uh, you know the that Ripka was brought to him, and uh, he's sixty years old when the uh, the two boys, Yitzhak and Jacob, twins, are born. So she's barren thirty or forty, sorry, twenty years, a long time, and there's the uh, the struggle in there, and this is. Just kind of a an aside here. Um, she said, "There's there's uh, something going wrong with this pregnancy. What's what's going on?" Yahweh speaks to her and tells her, gives her a, a revelation, tells her that two nations are in your womb, and two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. Keep that in mind as we take a look later on when these men are grown, these babies are born and grown, and there's this birthright uh, issue that's coming up. So she has this in her mind that was Yahweh uh, brought to her. So she gave birth. These are twins. Uh, the first comes out, and the first is Esau. He's red all over. He's a ruddy complexion. He's very uh, uh, ruddy. And uh, uh, and Jacob comes after him. And actually he grabs, the baby grabs the heel of Esau. And we see that in verse 26. Um, so the boys grew. Fast forward, Esau is this, this guy that is really Sort of what's called a man of the field is is what the uh, the uh, scripture says. He's a man of the field, and although yeah he was hunting, but the man of the field is really talking about a man of the world. He is a guy that is really focused on the world, and not so much Yahweh and and his way of life. 
and we can see as Yash, uh, as they grow up, um, Esau really has no interest in in anything about what his father and grandfather were working on. He's really not interested in that. He's interested in, you know, uh, basically uh, satisfying his own lusts. He likes hunting. He likes being outside. He likes, you know, fighting and things like that. And uh, he's uh, uh, not really interested at all in the things that the family has to do. And that's why we see here later in, uh, in, verse 20, in chapter 25 that he really despises his birthright. He really had no use for that at all. And trades it, he trades his birthright, basically, you know, a birthright for a firstborn son, basically would give you a double portion of inheritance, right? So if you're, uh, if, for example, you got two, two sons here, the firstborn would get a double portion. So instead of splitting it 50-50, right, it would be 75-25 because you'd get a double portion of the other one. So he really didn't care about that, even though his father, Yitzhak, was very wealthy, as we'll see later, uh, had a lot of money and a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, possessions, he really wasn't that interested in and really didn't care that much about the birthright. So we're going to skip over chapter 26 because that's really where most of our, where our teaching is really going to focus on. But, you know, summarizing this, this is talking about Yitzhak walk in the, among the nations. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Um, chapter 27 now, um, where is where, uh, uh, Yitzhak uh, confers a birthright, birthright. He's going to give it to Esau and tells him, go, you know, get me, uh, hunt some game, make me a, a nice meal. And Rebecca uh, comes up with this scheme to, to uh, sort of trick Yitzhak into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. Keep in mind, so, you know, why, why is she doing this? Why is she... Doing it. She does like, obviously likes uh, uh, Jacob better than her son Esau, and mainly because of the things that Esau was doing that were just really causing her a lot of bitterness. Um, for example, at the end of 26, chapter 26, we can see Esau was 40 years old when he took wives of Yehudeth, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basimeth, the daughter of Elan, the Hittite. Um, and they were a bitterness of spirit to Yitzhak and Ribka that were really causing him a lot of anguish that he married these, these women, you know, outside of, um, you know, their, their, their family, outside of their, their unequally yoked. And, uh, the, Obviously, these, these women caused a lot of uh, hardship and, and, and pain and anxiety to Yitzhak and Ribka. Um, obviously, they weren't very pleasant. So, continuing on in chapter 27 here, um, this is where the, the, uh, the birthright thing happens. And if you, you, know, you look back here... Um, Last year, we did a teaching on valuing our birthright, and we, you know, discussed this in, in a lot of detail there. Um, so if you'd like, go back on YouTube and take a look at that. The year before that, we looked at basically a contrasting between Jacob and Esau and the differences in their character and differences between the two. And uh, <clears throat> so if you want to take a look at those teachings, that would... Uh, maybe help your understanding here. But 27 really focuses on that, uh, that uh, concept of, uh, you know, the blessing coming to uh, Jacob instead of Esau. And uh, uh, Esau is extraordinarily angry over this. And he, he basically uh, tells everyone, broadcasts it, says, I'm going to kill as soon as 
as soon as the father dies, as soon as Yitzhak dies, I'm going to kill Jacob. Um, we see that in verse 41. And so, Jacob's got to kind of get out of there, get out of town, get out of Dodge. So he, uh, he packs up. Uh, Yitzhak blesses him, confers the blessing that he received from Abraham. He received the Abraham that we're going to talk about a little more. But uh, <clears throat> he says to, to, to Jacob, don't take a wife from among the people here in, in Canaan. You know, don't do like your brother did. Go to, uh, go to, back to, you know, where uh, I came from and, uh, or your, our father Abraham came from and take a wife from there from the, uh, the daughters of your, uh, your mother's brother, Bethuel. So that's where we, we uh, kind of end up in, uh, here in, uh, in chapter 28. Um, it finishes up, uh, the, the por portion finishes at um, chapter 9, where Esau does this again and takes more wives from people that were not part of, of, of uh, the stock that Abraham came from. So let's uh, kind of talk about a little bit about um, Yitzhak walk in chapter 26. And we're going to really kind of focus on um, Yitzhak rather than Esau and Jacob. We've done that the last couple of years, but let's focus now on Yitzhak and what he was really doing in this time. Um, <clears throat> So we start off here in uh, that um, the patriarch Yitzhak successfully kept the faith. He was, he was alive 180 years. He lived 180 years. Never, and he never despised the days of small things during which he lived. So where do I get the small things from? We go to Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10. We're not going to turn there, but it just reads... Um, the prophet Zechariah says, For who has despised the day of small beginnings? They shall rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of, uh, of uh, Zerubbabel. These are the seven, these are the eyes of Yahweh who diligently search through all the wor world. So we're talking about small, seemingly small things that uh, are often under overlooked on... Uh, with Yitzhak. I mean, if you look at, you know, how much uh, scripture is devoted to Abraham and also to Jacob, it's a lot more. Yitzhak's not really doesn't have a whole lot of, of uh, you know, uh, space in the scriptures talking about him. Unlike Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Yosef and Moshe and David and others, Yitzhak did not really play into what, you know, historians or Bible scholars would, would, might judge to be a significant role in the scriptures. Yitzhak's work was more of mundane and sort of pedestrian. It's really, you know, he just kind of did his job. He did his work. And Yitzhak often plays only a supporting role in narrations about Yab Abraham or Jacob when they talk about patriarchs well he's mentioned but you know there's not a lot talked about of what he really did so cha chapter 26 in Genesis however focuses on Yitzhak himself and showing that he like his father Abraham kept Yahweh's charge he was obediently remaining in Canaan rather than seeking refuge in Egypt during hard times. He was living among the nations, living among those, the, the Philistines, and he wisely managed the vast blessings he received from Yahweh. Yitzhak could not break new ground. He didn't come up with anything you know, new, uh, but he looked back to the days of Abraham, uh, redigging the wells that his father had dug, but which had fallen into disuse. 
and even giving them their original names. And he reinstituted the covenant his father had made with the Philistines, establishing a paradigm for social, political, and economic um, discourse with the Gentile and Israelites during, the, uh, during this time. So Yitzhak, um, like Yitzhak, Yahweh's people, you know, must maintain a proper perspective and recognizing that Yahweh has not called them to take the center stage now. Rather, Yahweh has called people to be faithful in little things today, continuing in good works and abiding in Messiah, knowing that he will eventually make those faithful in a few things ruler over many things. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. And this is the parable of the talents. I'm sure you're all very familiar with how that parable um, is, where uh, people are given different amounts uh, to work with, right? Different talents or uh, resources, basically. And if we, uh, we're going to start in verse... Uh, Yeah, we're in 25, and uh, if you the the parable of the talents basically starts in uh, in uh, verse 14. It's like a man going from home who called his own servants and delivered his possessions to them, and just for the sake of time, we'll just paraphrase this. It talks about giving each talents. One he gives five, one he gives two, one he gives one, right? It says, comes back and says, you know, what have you done with these things? The one who has five says, well, I got five more. He says, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Um, and we're, the, the, what we really want to focus on here is, is what Yahshua says in verse 21. He says, and his master said to him, this is the one with... Uh, uh, with five talents, well done, good and faithful or trustworthy servants. You were trustworthy over a little, and I shall set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So, although we're not, you know, don't have enormous responsibilities now, we don't have, you know, big, huge congregations, we don't have, we're not ruler, rulers over the people and things. He always given us a little bit to be faithful over. And that's really what we want to focus on, like Yitzhak did, is to be faithful over what we were given. So over, for over 180 years, Yitzhak stayed home. He, you know, stayed put. He held the fort. He kept, uh, he stayed the course and kept the faith. He was faithful in the small things and in little things. As such, there was, he was just like most of us. You know, who lead perhaps somewhat humdrum lives, perhaps only praying and paying, as we used to say, but called by Yahweh to endure to the end. So we're going to pursue this line of thinking here today. So only in Genesis chapter 26 do we find this extended section really just focusing on Yitzhak. Um, where he's, the, you know, the focus of the narrative. And even there, Abraham, although Abraham's already dead, uh, is not far in the background. Abraham's na name appears eight times in, in chapter 26. And that's an important point. When you read about Yitzhak, Abraham is never far out of the picture. The picture, the scriptures closely link the two of them, just as it links Yahweh the Father and his son. And we kind of delved into that quite a bit last week in the last Torah portion as we saw this picture of Yitzhak picturing Yahshua Messiah, Rebecca, Ribka, picturing the bride of Messiah, us being brought out of the world into, uh, into uh, where, where, the, uh, where, the, where the son was, where Yitzhak was. And so we, as we examine chapter 26, we keep in mind of what we explored last week. Um, and it really 
as you know, uh, reiterates what we see in Revelation 18:4, talking about "Come out of her, my people! Come out of Babylon!" So that's why, you know, Yitzhak was told not to take a wife from his uh, from the people in Canaan. You know, he brought his bride out of Babylon, out of the uh, the nations. So the intensity of Abraham's rhetoric is is uh, reminiscent of Peter. What Peter says here. We're just going to go to Second Peter, a second here. Second Peter chapter two, as he talks about the same idea of coming out. Second uh, Peter. We're in First Peter in the uh, Rev Shabbat studies, but today we're going to be in in Second Peter, and we're going to pick up in verse uh, verse twenty. He's talking about you know coming out and escaping the defilements of Babylon, and and he says here in verse uh, verse twenty, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world. Through the knowledge of the Master and Savior, Yahshua Messiah, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse than the first. And that's why that's the same thinking that Abraham had when he said, don't take a wife from my son from among these people. I don't want to go back into this, this, uh, this thing. I want to you know, bring, bring her out of that, that, uh, that system. So, although Abraham, you know, calls Ur, uh, we're still in, in chapter 26 here now, chapter 26 um, of Genesis, chapter 26 of Genesis. Um, although Abraham calls Ur my land, we see that in, in, uh, in chapter 26, uh, 24 verse 4 where he says uh, instructing Eleazar go to my land and to my relatives and take a wife from my son Yitzhak Abraham's really not you know talking about some you know deep seated lingering connection with his old home in Ur he understood that Yahweh had promised him Canaan or <clears throat> Canaan end, but he was only a stranger there at that time. He had not yet inherited Canaan. His comment about you know Mesopotamia or being my country reflects that fact. Applied to us, we can properly call we can call the United States or Canada or whatever country we're coming from my country at, at this time, but knowing full well that the kingdom is a promise but a land that has not yet been inherited. And Paul really talks about that in Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> so let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 and see what Shaul talks about this idea about um, about sojourning. Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll pick this up in verse uh, 16, <clears throat> 15. For this reason, verse 15, chapter 1 of Ephesians, I too, having heard of your belief in Master Yahshua and your love for the set apart ones, do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the Elohim of our Master Yahshua Messiah, the Father of esteem, or the Father of glory, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened so that you know what is the hope or the expectation of his calling and what are the riches of the esteem of inheritance of the set-apart ones. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who are believing according to the working of his mighty strength? So, <clears throat> again, this background of, um, of uh, <clears throat> this hope that we have of what we're going to inherit 
you know, same thing Abraham had. He he knew, although that, you know, his he he wasn't uh, going to physically inherit this land, but he would in the future. He would win the kingdom, but in the flesh, that wasn't going to happen. With this background about the primacy of the concept of the land in Abraham's thinking, let's go back to Genesis, and we're going to focus on Yitzhak. And uh, <clears throat> we start in, in verse 1 of, of chapter 26, and we see that there's a famine in the land. So food is very scarce. So that happened, of course, before with Abraham. And... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, so Yitzhak, instead of going to, to Egypt, he stays in the land here. And that famine, incidentally, you know, may have provided some, you know, of the overplot of Esau selling his birthright, um, described at the end of chapter 25. Pings were, people were hungry then, and, and uh, so that could have had something to do with that. But the famine was severe enough that Yitzhak was probably considering leaving the area of, of Canaan, which is really right on the edge, sort of, of going into Egypt. Uh, <clears throat> just as his father had done earlier, but before he took that step, Yahweh intervened. And uh, we see this in chapter 26, verses 2. Uh, and, he's, and Yahweh tells him, don't go to Egypt. Live in the land I command you, sojourn in this land, and it shall be with you, and I'll bless you, for I'll give you all these lands to you and your seed, and shall establish the oath I swore to your father Abraham, and shall increase your seeds like the stars of the heavens, and shall give you all these lands to your seed, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Again, the same promise he gave to Abraham. That promise was stated Back to Abraham in Genesis 13, 14 to 15. We, we, we read that a couple of Torah portions ago. <clears throat> and so, of course, that doesn't mean that Abraham inherited the land at that moment. Yahweh clarifies that. We see that with uh, that <clears throat> Stephen, under the in inspiration of Yahweh, uh, in Acts chapter... Seven. We'll just go there and see what Stephen says here in Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> and Stephen here was giving, you know, a, a very, very powerful, um, a powerful uh, sermon here. And uh, we'll just pick this up in, uh, in verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> he says, talking about Abraham, he, he came out of the land of the Kasdim and dwelt in Haran. And from there, after the death of his father, he removed him to this land which you now dwell. And he gave him no inheritance in it, not a foot in it, but he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. <clears throat> and Elohim spoke in this way that his seed would be sojourning in a foreign land and they would be enslaved and mistreated for a hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be enslaved I shall judge, said Elohim, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. So we see here that Yahweh, you know, uh, told Abraham he would, he would inherit this land, but it wasn't going to be during his physical lifetime. Same with us. You know, we have an inheritance that we're not going to receive during our physical lifetime. We're going to receive our inheritance. We're going to receive our, the promised land after Yahshua returns. And we're no longer in the flesh. We're no longer, um, uh, we're no longer physical human beings, flesh and blood. The writer of Hebrews also kind of reiterates this. Let's just kind of make this point a little bit more 
here as we go to chapter 11, the faith chapter of Hebrews. And in chapter 11, we'll pick this up in verse 8. By belief, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he was about to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By belief, he sojourned in a land of promise as a stranger, dwelling in tents with Yitzhak and Jacob, the heirs with him of that same promise. For he was looking for the city, having foundation, whose builder and maker is Elohim. That's so important for us to understand. So significantly, by giving Yitzhak the same promises he gave to Abraham, Yahweh gave both uh, patriarchs the same prophetic um, vision. Let's look in, in uh, Galatians chapter um, chapter 3 here. So Galatians chapter 3, we're going to pick this up in verse 7. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. Um, it says, Know then that those who are of the belief are sons of Abraham. So he's telling us, he's giving us some information here about our role. We are of, uh, of belief. We're the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, having foreseen that Elohim would declare right the nations by belief, announced the good news to Abraham beforehand, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you, so that those who are of belief are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Uh, so both Abraham, let's, uh, Shaul kind of pers personifies this now in the scripture, and saying that it was the word of Yahweh preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. Paul then tells how he did it. Abraham heard the gospel through the promises. Uh, and in verse 8, Paul uses as an example the promises that all nations would receive blessing through Abraham. That blessing is most specifically a reference to the saving work of, of Messiah, the gospel that that uh, of the, uh, the kingdom of Yahweh, that Yahshua came to be able to establish the rule of Yahweh in, in the kingdom, um, which would extend to everyone, to extend to everyone in the earth. So both Abraham and Yitzhak heard the same gospel, the same promises. Yahweh inspired and motivated both men by means of the same prophetic vision of course, it is precisely the same prophetic vision, the same promises that inspires and motivates us today. It's the gospel of the kingdom of Yahweh. So, um, back to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5, we have uh, one of the most standout scriptures here in this, in this uh, chapter here, chapter 26 and verse and it says and it says here why this is done because Abraham obeyed my voice kept my charge my commandments my statutes and my Torah so Yitzhak dwelt in Gerar. And the point is this. Um, Yitzhak did what his father Abraham did. Abraham kept Yahweh's charge. Yitzhak did the same. He followed in his father's footsteps. Something, um, you know, some of the other later, you know, prophets and, and leaders of Yahweh's people didn't do. Like Samuel, his sons didn't follow along. David's son, uh, Solomon, uh, ultimately didn't as well. He kind of fell away. Uh, all of David's sons were in some way sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, rebellious. Uh, although Yitzhak didn't do things perfectly, 
He did not turn to the right or to the left and frequently or extensively. He stayed the course. So we, uh, we continue on here. Y Abraham did teach Yitzhak. And Yitzhak did follow those instructions to the end that Yahweh will be able to bring about the promises he made to Abraham. And that's how important Yahweh considers Yitzhak's work of obedience. And as we discussed in you know, the last Torah portion, Yitzhak prefigures the father-son relationship between Yahweh the Father and Messiah. Messiah speaks of his father's instruction and his obedience to that instruction. We'll just, I'm going to just uh, reference here Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 to 6. We're not going to turn there, but um, this reads, Yahweh, here the Father, has given to me the tongue of the learned. This is sort of speaking, uh, Yahshua speaking in the... Uh, in his pre-existent form, as Yahweh here, the Father, has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Yahweh has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me. This is sort of prophetically Yahshua speaking in his pre-existent form. Yitzhak, like Messiah, made the decision to be obedient rather than rebellious, you know, and he had certainly opportunity to be rebellious. You know, he could have said, man, there's no food here in, in Canaan. I, I can't stay here. I'm going to Egypt where there's food. He didn't do that. He stayed, right? Um, both Messiah and Yitzhak followed their respective father's teachings. In Yitzhak's case, even to the point of permitting himself, as we know, to be uh, potentially sacrificed at Mount Moriah. He willingly submitted to that. So as we continue down here in verse 12 in Genesis chapter 26, we see here that this is in the midst of a famine now, remember. <laughs> Yitzhak sowed the land. So why is there a famine? There's probably no rain. There's probably a very dry, probably nothing's growing. But what does Yitzhak do? He obeys Almighty Yahweh's commands here. And he says, he said, I, I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to do the work. You know, and so what does he do in verse 12? Yitzhak sowed the land that reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And Yahweh blessed him. And the man grew great and went forward until he became very great. And he came to have possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great body of servants. And the Philistines envied him. Sound familiar around us? What happens when we're following Yahweh's ways? What? The people around us, you know, they don't say, oh, I wish I could be like him. I think I'll go to, you know, Sabbath service. No. What do they do? They want to attack. They want to, you know, beat you up. They want to give you a hard time. They want to, you know, make fun of you and and uh, and uh, and just berate you, right? Like the Philistines are doing to Itzhak. And the Philistines even went so far as they stopped up the wells. Now, you know, what kind of thinking is this? You know, you're in a desert. Water is very scarce, right? And you're going to fill in a well that has water in it? Why would you do that other than to just be spiteful? You know, that just doesn't even make any sense. Why would you do that? And uh, continuing on here in verse 15, the Philistines have stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father and filled them with dirt. And Abimelech said to Yitzhak, go away from us. You are much mightier than we. So, you know, he does. He says, okay, we're going to get out of here and we're going to go a ways away. But this, uh, this idea here is we, we back up a little bit. This English word, a hundredfold, um, that we see uh, this is translated here. In the Hebrew, it really is two words. It means a hundred measures. And it's, it's sort of a, an 
idiom that means just uh, an enormous maximum blessing, you know, just so big that you can't hold it. Um, and this is, you know, the, this we find this surplus associated with Yahweh's blessing so great that we seem unable to use it all. And it's a concept, you know, about, you know, so much, we have so much grace, it's uh, the, the capacity, we're not even able to hold it. Um, Malachi mentions the same thing in chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3. And this is kind of a challenge to people that think that, well, tithing doesn't really matter and it's not really something we have to do now. You know, Malachi chapter 3 uh, says this, um, Let's just go there a second. <clears throat> it starts in verse 8. And we've talked about this many times about tithes. As you said, you, can, you really have two choices. You can either steal it or you can and use it for yourself or you can give to, give to Yahweh what already belongs to him. In verse 8, it says, Would a man rob Elohim? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In the tithes and offerings. You have cursed me with a curse. You are robbing me, this very nation, all of it. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse and let there be food in my house. And please prove me, test me in this, says Yahweh of hosts. Whether I do not open for you the windows of heaven and shall pour out for you boundless blessings. Boundless blessings. And that's kind of what Yitzhak was experiencing here. Boundless blessings. Um, and uh, so it's, a, it's something for us to really to think about. Messiah himself alludes to this principle of, you know, this boundless, boundless blessings. Um, In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 38. Um, we'll just go there a second. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 38. Well, we're not going to go there. I'll just read it. Matthew 6 verse 28 is talking about, you know, a giving kind of attitude, a giving uh, attitude. And he says, uh, Give, and it will be given to you. A good portion, packed down, firmly shaken, overflowing, will fall into your lap. Uh, that's what, uh, what Yahweh is talking about, these boundless, boundless blessings. Um, I'm going to skip over that for the sake of time. Um, So, as we talk about Yitzhak living among the Philistines, um, here we we see in uh, in uh, in chapter twenty six and verse sixteen, um, where Abimelech says to Yitzhak, "Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we." So Yitzhak went from there and pitched his tent farther away in the Wadi Gerar and dwelt there. And Yitzhak dug again the wells of water which had dug in the days of Abraham his father. So he's doing the same thing his father did. He's going back to the ancient ways, to the old ways. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. But when Yitzhak's servants dug in the Wadi and found a well of running water there, the herdsmen of Gerar strove with Yitzhak's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well there es Esek, because they strove with him. So we can see here, rather than responding positively to the witness of Yitzhak's prosperity, the Philistines, what did they do? They threw him out. You know, kind of familiar with our walk now about how you know, we get treated sometimes by people in the world. The relationship sours, and further, the mighty Yitzhak, for his part, 
rather than using his his um, his wealth to enforce his rights, you know, he was a pretty wealthy guy. He probably could have fought back, um, which is exactly what many carnal, carnal people would have done in the same circumstance. Simply packs up and he moves on. He goes to this valley of Gerar, probably slightly to the west of Gerar proper, and then his workers redig the wells. Uh, more than re mere refurbishment, though, Yitzhak refer restores their original names, the names that Abraham gave them, and the Philistines just, again, showed really poor management. <laughs> you know, who, who in a desert would fill up a well? That just, it's just a spiteful thing. So the account indicates that along with destroying the wells, the Philistines had renamed their locales. So Yitzhak puts the original names back in there. That's the same kind of thing, the same kind of thinking we, we see even today, you know, where the names of places have been changed because they don't want to uh, uh, have Yahweh's people associated with that. You know, um, just today, you know, in Israel, and we see the town of Shechem uh, now is called Nablus. It's not called Shechem. <laughs> they, fill it, the the uh, Palestinians have renamed it. But one of the best examples is in uh, the Romans in AD 30, after that Bar Kokhba revolt, about 60 years after the fall of Jerusalem, the Roman Emperor Hadrian renamed Judea to Syria Palestinia. He, you know, he renamed that area. He called, wouldn't call it Judea anymore, which, uh, it, you know, it sticks to this day. Some historians believe he chose the name Palestine based on the word Philistine in order to stamp out Jewish cultural attachment to the land of promise. Uh, Hadrian, a couple, uh, many years later, also renamed Jerusalem to Aurelia Capolina, Capitolina, dedicating the city to their deity Jupiter, building a temple to him near where Yahweh's temple once stood. He turned the city into a Roman colony. So Yitzhak's work was a work of restoration. And so will Messiah's work focus on restoration and reconciliation. We have that you know, that same work that we're doing is, is restoring Yahweh's way of life and living that way of life in our own walk. Uh, Peter refers to Messiah's residing in heaven till the times of restoration. In his tremendously powerful sermon there on the day of Shavuot in Acts 3, verse 21, um, he talks about the, uh, that Messiah is residing in heaven until the restoration of all things. And, you know, all things here indicates more than just the restoration of wells. And, of course, it seems to include the restoration of the ancient names. Um, Isaiah talks about this, talking about way in the future. Isaiah 58, verse 12. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. This is Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12 can write that down for your notes. Uh, you raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the, of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Zephaniah also talks about restoring language. A couple of Torah portions ago, I think it was in uh, Noach, where we talked about the, uh, the nations, you know, building this Tower of Babel, they were all of one language, right? And because they were using that to, uh, to thwart Yahweh's purpose, Yahweh confused their languages. Well, he's going to restore a pure language again. We see that in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. He says, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may call upon the name of Yahweh to serve him with one accord. <clears throat> so in the millennium, Messiah will take steps to reverse the confusion of languages. Um, you know, we saw a small part of that 
in you know the day of Pentecost when the uh, the the languages uh, the confusion of the languages we had met people there that couldn't really speak to one another but through Yahweh's Holy Spirit through uh, a miracle allowed people to be able to hear the word uh, communicated in their own language and they could understand it um, so this kind of a backwards upside down of Tower of Babel it went to restoring that <clears throat> so uh, as we continue on um, you know uh, in uh, chapter 26 we're in verse 23 now um, that uh, talking about uh, about uh, uh, Yitzhak and uh, so what Yitzhak did with the wells there has an element of permanence to it and their well digging endeavors Yitzhak's people even find a spring that is running water is you know that's you know obviously very rare and valuable in in a desert and you know the Philistines quickly confiscated in verses 22 21 and 22 which uh, <clears throat> However, Yitzhak is able to hold on to this claim of the third spring his workers discover. And this is where we pick this up in verse 23. And he went up from there to Beersheba. Yahweh appeared to him that same night and said, I am Yahweh of your, of your father Abraham. Do not fear. For I am with you, I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of Yahweh and he pitched his tent there and there Yitzhak's servants dug a well. <clears throat> so Yahweh, Father Yahweh um, quiets Yitzhak and helps him kind of take a deep breath Say, don't worry, don't be afraid, I'm here with you, you're going to be okay. And uh, we're here in uh, perhaps something that, you know, might have spooked him in forcing his ro relocation to Beersheba. But remember, this is the same area where Abraham had made a covenant with Ab Abimelech. So... You know, we hear this name of Bimelech over many, many, many decades, really, from Abraham to, to Yitzhak. It's m almost certainly not the same guy. It's more of a title. Abimelech or Abimelech, Abi, father, king, the father, king. Um, so Beersheba was one of Abraham's favorite places where he put down roots, so to speak, and planting a tamarisk tree there. Uh, in verse 34, uh, he tells us, uh, this is in chapter 21, uh, that Abraham lived there many days. And in moving to Beersheba, uh, Yitzhak, reclaiming the land his father had loved and developed, there's a good chance that Yitzhak grew up around Beersheba, and he also you know, had childhood roots there. He remembered that area. So now Abimelech comes along in chapter 26 or verses, verse 26, and he kind of wants to make amends. You know, he wants to get along here because number one, Yitzhak is way more powerful than, than uh, he thought. So uh, <clears throat> we read through uh, chapter 26 and verse 26 to 29. Um, paraphrasing here, Abimelech comes to him and says, uh, we have seen that Yahweh is with you and let there now be an oath between us and let there be a covenant and uh, we see that you are blessed by Yahweh. Um, and Abimelech actually condemns himself with his own words here, admitting that he recognizes Yitzhak to be a righteous man, but still sent him away anyway and still had his uh, people fill his wells in. It's also noteworthy the king has no scruples at all in using now Yahweh's name in his efforts to gain his objectives. So 
Yitzhak uh, makes peace with these guys in verse 30 and 31. He had a feast. They ate and drank. Um, they departed in peace. So Abraham's dealings with the Philistines and Yitzhak's dealings with them form a pair, sort of a unit. And the two covenants made with the Philistines by Abraham and later by Yitzhak obviously invite comparison. There are physical and spiritual lessons here. Both Abimelech uh, of Abraham's day and the Abimelech of Yitzhak's day seem to have been motivated by seeking a covenant. They sue for peace. Um, and, he, you know, he says, we have seen that Yahweh is with you. You're now blessed by Yahweh. The Gentiles, the pagan Gentiles, recognizing the prosperity of the people of Yahweh, seek peace with them. So they... They want to kind of get in on it, but they don't actually want to do what, uh, what it takes to be in covenant with Yahweh. They, they're not really interested in that. They're really kind of interested in, in uh, how they can profit from this. <clears throat> so uh, as we begin to wrap this up, we're... Um, we're almost out of time here. So um, as we begin to wrap this up, we, we can kind of understand here that Yitzhak was, a, you know, sort of a very conservative guy in business and, you know, political matters with the, uh, the nations around him. Yitzhak sees the opportunity to renew the covenant his father had built, and he seems amenable, almost anxious to turn the clock back you know, rather than precipitately racing to turn it forward or to m plow new ground. So, for, ex for example, an alliance with the Hittites would be just that, something quite new, something his father had not done. But Yitzhak, like Messiah, was careful to do the works of his father. So if we look at, at John 14.10, uh, he says... Uh, Let's just go there, John 14, 10. Yitzhak, like Messiah, was careful to do the works of his father. John 14.10 says, Do not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak for myself, but the Father who stays in me does his works. Believe in me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe me because of the works of themselves. So we see then that Yitzhak restores what his father had built, refurbishing what had fallen out of use, and he carries on the work of his father Abraham. He doesn't vastly expand it or break new ground, and he certainly does not change its focus or direction. So it's important to notice that um, here in the New Testament, we. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed a spot out of my notes here. Oh, we're talking about the uh, the the apostles. Um, as we you know we 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 uh, we talked about Matthew twenty five, you know, in that parable of the talents. And he, 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 we, we, it's important to notice what the Messiah's audience was. Who's, who's he talking to when he, when he gives this, this uh, parable of the talents? It's, he didn't give that parable to everybody. You know, he didn't do that in public. He did that with his disciples. Uh, so Matthew 25 shares that same setting. That same venue, Messiah was speaking to his students, his select students, by learning to followers. And their responsibility at that time was to watch and listen, to learn. They were small, uh, though significant things. And 
yeah, occasionally Messiah sent them out to heal or preach, as we see in, in Matthew 10, but that wasn't their usual job at the time. Their usual job was t learning, t t uh, of uh, learning Yahweh's way of life. Later on, their responsibilities expanded, and they became apostles. And then finally, they did some really big things. And after all... Uh, Messiah endured that these same words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities, appear in the book for us. Using the apostles, Messiah gives us the words we need today. In the, in the New Testament, we repeatedly read words like continue, like as in the grace of Yahweh in, in, uh, in Acts 13.43. Um, this is Shaul after he's teaching here uh, people that were not Yehudim, they were not um, Torah observant people yet but they were interested in hearing let's go to Acts chapter 13 here a second and pick up the context there In Acts chapter 13, and we'll pick this up in uh, 40, uh, 42. And it says, when the Yehudim went out of the congregation, the nations, or you know, people who are not Jews, begged to have those words spoken to them the next Sabbath. And when the meeting of the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews, or Yehudim, and of the worshiping converts followed Shaul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the favor or the grace of Elohim. <clears throat> so those words we see, abide and stand fast and hold fast, things which may seem small, Messiah was not uh, so apt to use words like this when he spoke uh, about Moses. Consider uh, in Exodus uh, chapter 3 and verse 10, <clears throat> when Yash, pre existing Yahshua was speaking to Moses, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He spoke to Jeremiah, saying, You know, the same kind of thing. He spoke to Ananias, Ananias uh, regarding Paul and said, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 15, he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. <clears throat> so Moshe and Jeremiah and Paul, Shaul, as well as Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Yosef, Yahshua, David, Daniel, they did big things for Yahweh. Messiah has not called us today to speak to kings, at least not generally. And yes, we will vastly expand our powers and responsibility in the millennium. But as always, he will do that in his time. For now, he asks us to be faithful in the small things and not despising them. <clears throat> the verb despise that's used in, in uh, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10 that we started in the beginning means to consider something insignificant, it's not a big deal. Yahweh grants that they are small, but, but they're not insignificant, not to him. Esau despised his birthright, deeming it insignificant, and look what it cost him. <clears throat> so to those in the world, small things are not exciting, which is, you know, perilous is that Yahweh's people can come to deem those small things to be trifling, uninteresting matters and in time growing weary and well-doing you know that we see in in second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13 that's why you know sometimes we just people just don't want to listen to things that are you know the small things that we can do to improve our walk to improve our obedience to you know to be lights you know they want to see hear exciting things like prophecy I want to hear what does it mean in Revelation? What does this mean? What does that mean? What's going to happen next? They want exciting things. 
you know, that's not what we're about. We're about the small things. Doing, like Yitzhak, doing the small things right, doing the small things better every day, you know, the small obedient things that, you know, seem small to the rest of the world, but to Yahweh they're a big, big deal. He, he considers our obedience and our striving to be more obedient very, very important, like Yitzhak. <clears throat> so if we're not careful, you know, this sort of ho-humness or this mundane sort of uh, existence that we had can lead to um, apathy and manifesting itself even in physical fatigue. But... You know, fatigue is uh, is uh, can cause laziness and and become apathetic and fall asleep. We all know what the dangers are there. So <clears throat> we dare not respond to the work of Yahweh has called us to do, whatever it might be. Maybe it's small things like praying. That's a very big deal, but. You know, some people will say, well, I can't really do anything. All I can do is pray. That's huge. That's a huge deal. Maybe you don't have the physical strength or you don't have the health or, you know, the resources to be able to, you know, contribute more. But you can pray. And that's very, very important. Yahweh hears the prayers of those, uh, those people. So it might seem small. Um... But the work he has given us is not insignificant. It simply is not. It's very, very important. So we don't want to despise the days of small things. For 180 years, Yitzhak was faithful in small things. And incidentally, it appears that, you know, he was blind, you know, for some of that period. At the end of his life, he could really hardly see it all. Yet he carried on the work of his father living the way his father taught him, and as we say, keeping the faith. Now make no mistake about it, that was important to Yahweh. And it remains important today. So we'll, uh, we'll finish up with uh, Colossians chapter 1. Let's just go there. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And we're here in, uh, we're going to pick this up in verse uh, 19. Because in him all the completeness was well pleased to dwell. We're talking about Yahshua. And through him to completely restore to favor all unto himself, whether on earth or in the heavens, having been peace through the blood of his stake. And you, who were once estranged and enemies in the mind by wicked works, but now he has completely restored to favor in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy or set apart and blameless and unreprovable before him. Indeed, you continue in the faith founded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope or the expectation of the good news which you heard, which was proclaimed to every creature under heaven, which I, Shaul, became a servant. So let's think about Yitzhak and his faithful, obedient walk among the nations and kind of use that as a guide for ourselves and emulating. He's one of the people that we can emulate on our walk in this, this time now and, and ever trying to improve our obedience and do our Father's work. So we, we uh, praise and thank Almighty Yahweh and uh, we'll end the teaching right there.